Shall we begin? I'm just trying to figure out if we are live or in case for the ones who join later, but in any case, I'm recording it, we can post it. Yeah, we'll begin. Uh, so, hello everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we're excited and overwhelmed to have you all and all the, all the support and love you've shown us the last couple of days and weeks have been overwhelming. And we're all here today to discuss uh, this book and give you our impressions of the book. So first, Aranyani and I will discuss and this will, uh, we'll take this forward with, uh, with a, a with a discussion with Dr. Saskia Kersenboom, who's there in the audience with us today. Uh, so initially it will be a discussion between me and Aranyani. Uh, just a gentle reminder for all of you to keep your audios muted. Uh, you're most welcome to ask questions. Uh, you can type out in, uh, and then we'll let you know when you can ask and most welcome to ask questions. It will be interesting if you ask us questions as much as you ask uh, Saskia Akka because we really want this to be a discussion within ourselves because we should be talking uh, all of this as much as, uh, and take our questions forward uh, to Saskia Akka. So uh, really before, uh, without taking any more time, thank you all and we will begin today's uh, session. So Nitya Sumangali was a book, uh, which is a consequence of Dr. Saskia Kersenboom's years of research, living in the Devadasi settlements, working with and learning from uh, some of them uh, firsthand, learning and inheriting the repertoire. She initially uh, submitted this book as her PhD dissertation. It was towards her PhD dissertation in 1984. And following this, she uh, it was published in 1987 by uh, Motilal Banarsi Das uh, Publication House. There have been five editions so far, and uh, we await the sixth edition around this year's uh, music season. So for those who haven't uh, uh, yet got the book, you can wait to get your new uh, edition as well. And uh, the other uh, thing that I wanted to say is for those who haven't really read the book, it's a great idea to start with the Parampara videos we have been sharing over the last couple of days. It, it has images of these Devadasi settlements and a lot of things that are spoken of in, and discussed in the book you, uh, she shows in these videos, which are actually a part of her residency programs. So Dr. Saskia conducts these residencies for, stu for students in the uh, Devadasi settlements Make, uh, making them experience uh, the temple rituals and uh, 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 passing down the repertoire, the very precious repertoire she has uh, learned. So it's a good way to, if you, you haven't really read the book, you, you should go through the videos, just a suggestion. And uh, before we say anything else, it's uh, the word Nitya Sumangali itself, I think must have existed in the, uh, at the grassroots level in, uh, in the villages, in the Devadasi settlements, in literature, but it was probably first brought to light and used in academic parlance by Dr. Saskia Kersenbu. And it is uh, her uh, research and her bringing to light of this term that inspired many scholars of later ages researchers, books, and even movies. So it is really an honor for us to have her who is brought to light this term and this uh, seminal work on the Devadasi heritage to have her. We'll have her in just a few minutes over in the screen. Uh, so over to Aranyani. Uh, uh, will you start sharing your impressions, Aranyani? Yeah, you'll have to unmute. <laughs> Uh, hi everyone uh, and again I won't repeat everything that uh, Mahalakshmi said but yeah thank you all for coming and it's uh, very exciting for us to be doing this. Uh, so we thought that we'd first talk about our own impressions so I'll just give you a very brief um, uh, and very personal um, account of what I felt when I was reading the book. Uh, one of the first things that uh, came to my mind as I was reading it and because as I was reading it I was going back and forth again and again was that this is not a book that you can read just once. Uh, it has to be read over and over again 
uh, even while you're reading it, you have to read it again. And then I think because as I finished reading it, I wanted to start reading it again. So that's that's my very first impression is that you have to read this book more than once. Um, the other really strong feeling that I had when I was reading the book was that it had, it really did transport me, I felt, to another time and another space um, and uh, to another era almost. And uh, it really left me feeling very, very much more indebted to the Devadasi heritage and the, and the Devadasi tradition than I was already. Um, so that was the second uh, uh, impression that the book left on me, this, this feeling of being transported away from uh, the present realities and, and into, a, into a, a world that is very different to the world of Bharatanatyam and dance that we uh, exist within today. And coming to that, uh, connected with that is my third impression, which was that uh, for me, the book was very visual. So it was almost it was a textual as well as, as well as a visual delight, uh, and and you know gave very visual insights. And I don't mean uh, because the book uh, for those of you who've read it, it has graphs and and maps and you know layouts of the temples and and uh, these little crosses where the devas travel across during their during the ritual and during during their practice and all of that. But uh, it's not because of that that I don't mean visual in that sense, but actually like. Um, you know, while you're reading that there's almost like another visual um, dimension that's simultaneously happening in, in your imagination, where you actually feel like you're there, you are, you are taking those steps with the Devadasis, and you are, you are actually in that, uh, that space and time when, when you're reading. So that also was uh, something that I felt very strongly as I was reading the book. Um, then another very exciting, slightly lighthearted impression of mine was the just the excitement of of seeing how the Tishra Alaripu was performed. I mean, not seeing how it was performed, but the fact that it was performed, the fact that Sarasi Jakshulu was performed. You know, these are these are pieces that we've learned when we were little kids without knowing where it came from, or um, you know, I mean, at that age we don't really know these things, but. Um, just the excitement of that, that, oh my God, the fact that these, these pieces that we are performing were, were performed back then in this completely different setting and with a completely different function and uh, uh, yeah, and that they have survived today despite everything and, you know, from generation to generation they've passed out. It's just such a marvelous feeling to, uh, to have that realization that these same pieces are performed uh, today, of course, in different ways, but uh, to see those words was quite exciting. Uh, the other thing that I that I feel, and I'll stop very soon because I want the discussion to be uh, more interactive. I mean, we all do. Mahalakshmi, me, and uh, Dr. Saskia, we all decided that we wanted to make this as interactive as possible. Uh, but another thing was that uh, I really felt like it was quite a technically heavy book in the sense that it was very... Um, packed with information. Every page was packed with knowledge and information and uh, without judgment, actually. I think that was my impression, that it wasn't a judgmental text. It wasn't an opinionated text. Uh, 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 you know, it wasn't, I didn't feel that it was, it was very heavily uh, opinionated in any way. Uh, rather, I felt that it was a very generous sharing of knowledge uh, about a world that uh, we no longer have access to. Um, you know, the, uh, the, the world of the Devadasis before uh, independence, before um, all the changes that took place uh, politically, socially, culturally, uh, in, the, in the tradition uh, and, and in the world of Bharatanatyam itself. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I would say that that, that was my uh, final impression is that it was not a judgmental text and it was uh, a very, very generous sharing of knowledge and something that I feel uh, anyone who's studying Bharatanatyam or any or any dance form actually in India, uh, and anyone who's interested in Bharatanatyam or dance or uh, even even Hinduism and ritual in general uh, should should read this book. Over to you, Maha. I think you should uh, tell us your impressions. Mine are not really impressions because I didn't. I really wanted to get people to read the book. So I'm going to throw in a lot of interesting tidbits and gleanings that I have learned and which appeal to me. 
so they're not not just impressions but i might be sharing some information that saskia akka has given in the book itself uh, so one of the things that uh, for me before reading this book understand what i thought of devadasi was uh, that she was an artist she knew music dance and she performed so she was employed by a temple and she performed and i also thought nitya sumangali and devadasi was synonymous uh, so this idea the book introduces you to this idea that nitya sumangali is a concept and the devadasi is only an expression of this concept so that's very fascinating one of the very many fascinating ideas that the book introduces you to the other thing uh, for me which i've already uh, discussed with aranyani is that idea of ritual uh, visualizing ritual as a theatrical performance that ritual is a theater in the hindu pantheon in you know that all of this so it shakes you if you're a, if you have been believing and performing rituals all your life and then uh, you you understand that all of this is actually sort of a drama and the art of the devadasi was conceived for this ritual for this drama uh, so that really it shook me but it really appealed to me and that makes so much sense because the life of the devadasi and the ritual and hence the art sort of depended on the gods and goddesses she was dedicated to now hinduism uh, being like from the book uh, i'm picking out things from the book you know adopts from so many different divine forces you know you don't want just one you want the ant hill you want the navagraha you want the tree you want the animal you want a plant you want you want to worship everything so the devadasi had to appease so many uh, factors and hence i think that gave me sort of a perspective as to why the devadasi repertoire and ritual itself is so rich uh because she had she had to do a piece so many different gods right so that is very uh, that appealed to me and that gave me perspective on her ritual uh and her uh the the variety of the repertoire and it gave me that explanation that i was seeking i think one of the major criticisms that this book has been facing over the last two decades is that it has glorified an oppressive system uh i i want to address that at this point uh, before i read it i was also maybe a little skeptic much before i read it but then i must say it's a very systematic study of the devadasi system before the 1947 how how it happened why it happened and where it happened and its purpose so uh, you, and this it's very systematic in even the layout of the book itself the first chapter deals with you know the probable antecedents of the system from where it probably originated and then the second chapter goes on to the form the right uh, the, the rituals involved in hinduism and then the rites of passage that the devadasi had to go through uh, also it's a uh, it's very interesting that she starts right from the sangam era because none of the other studies really examine from where did it begin you know we are, we we all probably knew that it started the term devadasi as we know of today probably uh, had its origins in the chola period but what before that is something she has inquired probed into from literature and she's identified probable antecedents and probable origins in the bardic culture where the king was there the bards surrounded and these ritual women propitiated the evil appeased gods and made place uh, made the king's uh, place and palace auspicious even during the time of the bards and then later local village cults and how that so beautifully ties into the agamic uh, rituals itself because Uh, how agamic rituals borrow not on uh, are not only vedic and sanskritic but also borrow and adapt from local village cults and also from the tamil 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 saivite literature as well and even tamil saivite literature being incorporated into the uh, devadasi repertoire i did not know of the devarams being a part of the repertoire itself so yes it's a very systematic study but also it's not really chronological because she does go back and forth to compare so you do compare the rites of passage between the devadasi of the of the devadasi that we know of with some of, uh, of the village cult and the bardic rituals and so on so it's not really chronological but it's very systematically 
done. But uh, the other idea that uh, was new to me here was why is the Devadasi so, why is the Nitya Sumangali so auspicious? It is because of her ability to deal with the divine. And this actually came up in a conversation with Saskia Akka we had that she said she was not just dedicated to God, but she was there to protect the vitality of life itself, you know, to keep away all the dangers from life. Like, because the divine was not only powerful, but dangerous. So the Devadasi Nitya Sumangali was entrusted with a very massive responsibility of keeping away evils for the people. And that was, again, a new idea for uh, me. And that is what made her very auspicious. And that is what made even the gods mourn her death. So apparently, there is a, a where I found this funny, uh, that God was a uh, uh, bitter vegetable after the Devadasi, uh, uh, during the funerary rites of a Devadasi. So the, the gods had to mourn the Devadasi's death because of the stature she had in the society uh, itself and the I, the devadasi is so powerful because of different manifestations which again i'm picking out from the book for for the benefit of those who haven't really read she lists three aspects one her femininity which itself is uh, corresponds to her divinity and then the ritual objects that she uses which are the kumba arati and all the rituals that she performs to keep the keep away all the dangers and then the art so uh, it is very new to me that the art was only a part of the Devadasi, but not the whole of all of the Nitya Sumangali. So the art, and hence the rich, hence uh, when she talks about the kautvams being performed in rituals, she says they were very simple uh, dances or simple performances because they were meant to be very ritual, ritualistic and meant to be performed in what we know today as a muddy state or a clean state and that was again a very interesting how they had to be ritually and uh, you know physically clean to do these rituals and dance because dance these uh, pieces and and that was again something that was very interesting I, I will not take too much time one last thing I found this uh, aspect also very interesting that the Devadasi system was very heterogeneous it was not it's not homogeneous they borrow uh, it was not a com uh, it's not a homogeneous community, but they could borrow and recruit women from different castes and different uh, castes to work in the temple and they recruited the women. So, and I use the word recruit because there was an elaborate process of recruitment, which she deals with in her book about how they were recruited and the process from application to employment could take over six months and how these women had to observe how they had to conduct themselves during these six months of you know, recruitment and uh, so on. Uh, so lastly, before we have uh, Saskia Akka over, I just want to add one last thing, which again, you know, appealed to me that as a dancer of today's time, I'm sure many dancers, that I have been mentally conditioned that my dance is a sort of a soul searching activity, the Jivatma and Paramatma. And I've been conditioned to think of it that way. But I understand from this book that the ritualistic tradition of the Devadasi did not have this Jivatma Paramatma concept or the Atman searching uh, the Brahman. So this was very uh, interesting. And this made me think about how artistic temperament has changed from that time as much as we have retained the pieces themselves, but the artistic temperament has changed from the ritual to today's performance. Uh, so that was again, something very, uh, that appealed to me. Uh, and yeah, so these were set of random things that I put forth to all of you on what appealed to me. Uh, so yeah, so I invite Saskia Akka uh, to switch on her video and we will have a discussion. I can't find her. Okay, let me go on the chat. Saskia Akka? Karam, Vanakam. Vanakam Akka, I am just trying to spotlight your video or uh, just give me a second. Uh, there are a lot of people and I'm trying to find Saskia Akka. Oh, there. Oh, Where? <laughs> it has to be on my screen, Aranyani. <laughs> uh, 
Saskia ka. Did I wave or? Oh yeah, I found you. Yeah. Add spotlight. Yeah. Thank you, Akka. Thank you, Akka. Thank you so much for joining in. We're all excited to listen to you. Uh, so we have a couple of questions for Akka, following which we open the floor and you can all ask her questions or you send us a text while we're asking and we'll open it for you to ask questions as well. Yeah, Aranyani, do you want to begin? Yeah, is it spotlighted on everybody's screen? Is it, uh, can can somebody give us a thumbs up? Saskia yeah, can is on. Saskia Akka is not spotlighted? No, no, I'm... She says no. Uh, but so, but in her say I'm yes. Fine. I'm fine with this. Masoom says no. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I also uh, I can see Saskia Ka with a, a lot of other thing. people. I'll remove my spotlight and not spotlighted, but we see her. Okay. Yeah. Uh, As in, we can all see her. I mean, I can see her. The view. Okay. 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 Should we? No, I don't know. You carry on. I'll figure out. You ask her the first oh. question. Uh, hi, Akka. Namaskar. Uh, Namaskaram. The first question that we would like to ask you is, uh, how did you come to study the Devadasi heritage? Uh, we've talked about your journey privately, but we thought that we would love for you to share it uh, because it's such a fascinating uh, journey. Okay, thank you very much. First of all, I would like to thank you and Mahalakshmi for inviting me because this is really a very emotional event. Uh, to start the program, you know, waiting for the program to start and to hear Ranganaiki's voice from Tirutani, to hear uh, Shelva Ganapati's um, Nagas from, from Tiruvar, to hear Nandini's voice singing uh, Tiru, um, Tiruvarano, to hear uh, Dhani K. Varnam from Balasaraswati's family. This is really a true smarana of my teachers and of my years spent in India learning and in kind of getting embedded in this tradition. So I feel that it is very, very kind of encouraging that young people like you are interested to go back and to question and to go to, to study a book that is already 36 years old. But it is rejuvenating and it is really carried forward by all of you. So this is very, very kind of uh, happy feeling for me. So I'm glad to share and once more, thank you for your invitation. And all those who have come to join us, thank you very much for following the coming half an hour. So let, let me now continue to your question. So what made me uh, involve myself so deeply in South India, Bharatanatyam, Devadasi tradition? Well, actually it started, you know, when I was still in school in the sense that uh, I followed what in the Netherlands, I'm from the Netherlands originally, is called a gymnasium. And I was a typical alpha girl. That means not an alpha male or an alpha female, but <laughs> I, I was studying Latin and Greek uh, for five or six years. And I was so thrilled to come to Italy to see that actually in Italy, Italian is kind of a continuation of what I studied in school. So I was very much drawn to to prehistory and to archaeology and as a student I even was digging in the neighborhood of where I was living and in the Netherlands that was only prehistory. So I, I like that activity of being confronted with the remains of culture but I realized but I can't talk to these people. I mean I, I just find traces and bones and pots and pans but I can't talk to them. So to go further into Latin and Greek, that was really not what I was after. So I looked up university possibility and there was Sanskrit. And of course, having studied Latin and Greek, we are aware, made aware that Sanskrit is related to Latin and Greek. So I thought, why not? This is another gymnasium. This is the gymnasium of Asia. Because if you know Sanskrit, it stretches up to Indonesia. So first I tried out classes with Indology, and these were classes by Professor Jan Honda, Gonda, a very famous Sanskritist, and I liked it so much, so I enrolled. But of course, Sanskrit at the time was very much grammar and studying texts, 
getting into translation and I was missing the people. I thought this is not a dead language. This is a language that is alive and the culture is alive. So even before I attained my BA, I went to India and there I really was hit by what you, Mahalakshmi, uh, kind of highlighted, the dramatic qualities of Hinduism in Tiruvarur. When I saw the dance of Tyagaraja, my mental eye saw this is where the Devadasi must have been. As the procession proceeds, the shouting, the singing, the Nagasvaram, and indeed you heard um, a Nagasvaram composition where Devadasis were dancing to that kind of original Nagasvaram music. So this was a fever that gripped me and it never left me. And it takes me today to talk to you. <laughs> Everything in between happened because actually of Tiruvarur seeing Tyagaraja dance, hearing the Nagasura music, hearing the procession, studying with Nandini Ramani, Bala Saraswati's tradition in Chennai, it all really came together in this quest. Who were the Devadasis? Is this a good answer to your question in the sense that it enlightens you? How did it all come about? Yes, but what happened after that? We won't know. <laughs> so, we are in now 1975, uh, my first visit to India, and uh, I have a ballet background, 20 years of ballet, classical ballet, and all kinds of uh, gymnastics and figure skating, <laughs> all kinds of things, you know, which you think are very far removed from Bharatanatyam, but actually they are not, because it basically uh, requires you to embody what you're interested in. And the moment that you have to embody dance, it dictates its own demands. If you want to embody Bharatanatyam, you have to learn the language. You have to learn the music. You have to go to places. You have to live the culture to understand the sentiments that go into the songs and the dances. So in 1977-78, I got an ICCR scholarship and I stayed in the house of Nandini Ramani, my teacher. Uh, and I also lived with her parents, Dr. V. Raghavan and Mrs. Sharada Raghavan. We went to the music season. I met Ramganayaki, I met Bala Saraswati. It was very, very rich, immersive experience. And in 1980, I got the four year PhD kind of fellowship, which enabled me to do four years of research, write the book and defend it. And at that time, uh, I was, by that time, when I kind of submitted the manuscript in January, 1984, I was, 30 years old. So I had spent, uh, let me see, that means, um, yes, six years of immersion in India, which brought me to the level, uh, of, no, not six years, uh, 11 years. I mean, six years of starting my PhD research. 11 years, uh, and there was Nitya Sumangali. So why Nitya Sumangali? When I started the Nitya Sumangali research, I was romantic. And I had this kind of idea that they were sacred artists. And it was really up to me to, to find out and prove this. But it didn't work. You know, living in an Indian family and going to temples, this whole idea of the sacred artist is a very romantic notion of the 19th century Europe. The visionary artist who digs deep into the soul and, you know, then this visionary. And, no. It is a very pragmatic environment where every action has a purpose. It should lead to something. It's very important. Efficacy is very important. So you have to get the working logic. And this working logic is not only in the Devadasi, it is in the culture. So a very simple question really opened the door to me. And that was, if the Devadasi is auspicious, if the Devadasi is this kind of sacred person, can she wear toe rings? And you know, it is very important in the South, and I presume in the, in the North there is also a custom of wearing toe rings. It is really the marker of a married woman, a married woman whose husband is alive. And the fact that the husband is alive makes her auspicious, not because there is so much of a husband, but because she protects the husband. This is bad news for men they cannot be happy without a wife who protects them. 
<laughs> so the Devadasi has the toadings and she can wear the kumkumam. She can wear even the parting in the hair as red. She can always wear flowers because actually her kind of relationship is to a husband who cannot die. So she is everlasting. The moment a lady loses her husband, she has to take off the ring, she has to remove the tali, she has to break her bangles. She no longer can kumkumapot to the kumkum powder. And a Devadasi can always do that. And why? So then the why really brought me to this concept that she protects life. And life is a very complex continuum of happiness and of danger. Shubha and Dukkha. And the Dukkha is everywhere. And it can pound on you everywhere. And that is why the Devadasi is there to be a kind of safety valve against that danger, which is everywhere around it. We'll get back to that later, I think. So where, where further do you want to go? I think, you know, 1984 is nice for the nice <laughs> next question. Is that okay with you? Yeah. Uh, Akka, so I wanted to ask you your work uh, in many places you suggest there's a collaborative interdependence between the royalty, Devadasis, and even the Brahmins. Could you like shed us uh, shed some light on you know how this collaboration and this interdependence worked? Um, you know, I think first and foremost it's very important to realize that Nityo Sumangali uh, deals with the period until 1947. So pre-independence. So especially in Tirutani, it is very uh, interesting to see that the Raja of Karveti Nagar, Venkatapiruma Raja, he was there well into the 1940s. So we really see that in the kind of cubicle of this Tirutani hill, which is a very restricted space, we have a showcase of what in other places was gone a long time ago when the Rajas were kind of, um, how should I say it, um, robbed, let's put it like that, of their titles, and the feudal society was dismantled, the entire system started actually to break down. But it was a very vital system of interactive relationships, which uh, really led to the purpose of beauty, of uh, art, uh, of protection. And in the case of Ranganaiki, it was very clear that they were colleagues of the Brahmins. If you go to Tirutani Hill, Tirutani Temple, there is behind the temple, there is the village, it's called Nele Tirutani, Upper Tiru Tirutani, that, where there is a, a temple tank, their own tank. On the right side, the Brahmins are living, the Guruka, and on the left side, the Devadasis were living. In the Devadasi street, the Devadasi street, there is a Saraswati Sharakoil, and the Brahmanas, they have their um, Brahmanavidi Pilayar. They have their own Vinayaka. Uh, if you turn to the left, you see the Nagasuras. They are still Nagasura players, the Melakarans. They are still living there. And this was a very functional society. Everybody was working together. And there was no case of... Um, how should I say it, um, antagonism. They were colleagues. And when Ranganaiki Yama taught me Pushpanjali and Manjidi Namu, she was extremely proud of me. So I, she had to show me off everywhere. So I was also showed up in Gurukula houses, uh, Gurukal houses and in the temple <laughs> places. So here I saw really uh, an ancient situation that Brahmins, Devadasis, musicians, they work together. If you think of the Tanjur court, you could see how strongly intercast the kind of court culture was and how inspirational it was. Basically, one had to be a Rasika in order to appreciate the art that was going on and one had to be an expert and that expertise was spread over several castes. So the kind of pre-1947 India cannot be judged by the problems that are faced today or that are being discussed today. It is very important to understand and try to appreciate cultural phenomena within their own time frame and within their own cultural notions. You cannot kind of um, flash back uh, 
the Declaration of Human Rights, which is 1948, 100 years back into Tanjur or 50 years back into uh, Tiruvarur. So um, I'm speaking from what I have experienced. I am not a kind of judgmental in the sense that I am trying to find causes and effects of evil that has to be, um, how should I say, mended. The Devadasi world, the, Deva, the world of Agamic kind of cosmology and cosmopraxis of Gurukas, Melekarans, Oduvars, was a world of its own right. It served its own purposes. And I, it was my kind of vision to bring alive that world, an act of, as I said earlier, of Smarana. This has to be remembered. Unless you know where you're coming from, it's very difficult to orient yourself where you're going. So that is the agenda of Nitya Sumangali. And that is the world that I found. And that is cannot be compared with the world that we live in today. Is this an answer to your question? Oh, yeah. But also that uh, you, at some instance, you talk about uh, Muttuswami Dikshitar's father training Devadasi women in singing, and even uh, this uh, uh, Devadasi called B.N. Rajalakshmi having uh, trained mm -hmm. under someone called uh, Sri Sesha Iyengar. So there was also that kind of Guru Sishya learning that was happening, right? I mean, if you think of the times you quoted, Oh, yeah. <laughs> of course. <laughs> of course. Okay. Aranyani, uh, I think, you know, this kind of uh, heterogeneity uh, should be taken into account and appreciated in its own time frame. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, Aranyani, you have another question? Yeah. You have muted yourself. I am oh, sorry, sorry technologically challenged um, <laughs> yeah so uh, the next question that maha and i thought that we'd ask you was about the term natya sumangli itself uh, which i think you've already gone into a, uh, in in another question in a previous question but um, uh, what we thought that we wanted to ask you to address a little bit more was this idea of the marriage to the god uh, which is a much debated subject at the moment and um, and also what exactly was that uh, uh, the, the marriage to the god, the fact that the, what made them uh, auspicious and unable, uh, the, you know, the, the ever auspicious uh, Nitya Sumangli. And also, if you could differentiate between, uh, for the viewers, differentiate between Nitya Sumangli and Devadasi Nitya Sumangli. Also, Akka, I, uh, on the same note, can you, uh, if uh, being ever auspicious was so prestigious and had held such a high stature, why didn't other communities, uh, uh, why didn't, uh, you know, other communities give their daughters into this tradition? If you could tell us something on the same note. Uh, so now these are actually uh, three questions, <laughs> a bunch of questions. I was just going to say. Which uh, I, I think I, I prioritize. I, I start with the term. So actually, this was mentioned earlier, uh, Nitya Sumangali, the term, is a grassroot term. It was around in Tamil culture, and you can find it even in the Tamil lexicon. Uh, the Tamil lexicon has supplement 1982, which I didn't know at the time, because for me, it was the question of the toe rings that kind of uh, revealed the Nitya Sumangali. But really, it is a synonym of Theyavadiyal. <laughs> Not the Sanskrit dictionary, it is the Tam dictionary, which is Nitya, Nitya Sumangali, of course. And Nitya Sumangali is the Variyal. So um, when we think of the term, this term has had a very powerful appeal to the public fantasy. It is really amazing that uh, I published Nitya Sumangali in, or I defended Nitya Sumangali in 1984. And throughout the book, you can see that basically I'm dealing with a concept. The concept which can be, you know, it's, it's basically an abstract concept which has many applications. And then we come to the applications of the Devadasi, Nitya Sumangali. Nitya Sumangali, Nitya Sumangali is basically a cultural imperative. The culture, South Indian Hinduism, needs a character 
who a functional character who deals with danger. I, in the introduction, I say that this is a, actually a hidden aspect of Hinduism that is not advertised very much, that doesn't come out to the forefront, but basically the Nitya Sumangali is auspicious, almost in a euphemistic sense. It is not you get a compliment that you fantastic, I congratulate you, you are a Nitya Sumangali. You are a Nitya Sumangali because I need you. Mm. It is something like the Tamil, the Nala Pambu. I mean, the cobra is, of course, <coughs> but he is called Nala Pambu. Nitya Sumangali is a very important character to deal with danger because as life evolves, Life is a continuum of danger and of happiness, of, as we said earlier, sukha and dukkha, but very, very kind of um, aggressive danger, which you find in um, ghosts, in pace, in um, but a very important category of mala, which is impurity. And mala is not impurity of the mind that you are thinking um, kind of immoral thoughts. Mala is something like coronavirus. It sticks to you, you get sick, and you may die of it. And you need somebody to protect you against that. And that is the constant factor of how to deal with this. And how to deal with this is via fire. And that is where the Kumbharati comes in. And of course, as you know, or only yourself, I'm talking to mostly an Indian audience. Um, the idea of reality is very heterogeneous. There is a tamasic aspect, aspect of reality. There is a rajasic aspect of reality. There is a sasatvic aspect of reality. And we cannot all aim to live in the sasatvic aspect because that is not realistic at all. The majority of us lives actually in a kind of rajasic. We are active, we are householders. We care about life. We want to have love. We want to have children, we want to have dharma, artha, kama. Moksha is for later. So this whole idea of dharma, artha, kama, that is actually what one finds in agamas as something to be followed for householders. But of course, I have to just... Okay. Um, but of course, this is not a, a territory that can be protected in a vacuum situation. Because the tamasic is always knocking at your door. So all of you remember and are confronted daily with Arati. Is there somebody among the Indian audience who does not know what is Arati? I don't think so. Everybody knows Arati. Arati is performed at every other step, crossing a, a threshold, uh, entering a house, coming back home from a gathering. And now the Devadasi is no longer there to do that. But actually, in the past, the Devadasi could do that, or the Nitya Sumangali could do that, because she was empowered by different rites, by different dikshas, if you call that, that her kind of aspect of the goddess, her inner Shakti, because women, we all share that, even men share it half, <laughs> but <laughs> women share it in full. This identification with the goddess was actually her first dedication. So when we are talking about the marriage of the Devadasi, it is not the marriage you, that you should understand in the nuclear family. You know, the romance and the dating sites, and you know, finally it all happens, there is going to be marriage. No, marriage is just a sanskara. It is a rite of passage. There are many Hindu sanskaras, you know, from the name giving ceremony to the piercing of the ears to the first food to the first learning and vivaha kalyanam vivaha is just a sanskara and it is the sanskara that enables you to be part of the system and nobody should be left out of the system indian kind of planning is amazing how detailed it is ultimately everybody whether it is a high caste or a low caste is part of the system so if you are married to a living husband, you are in danger because the danger after all the husband may die. So uh, in that case, you are not danger proof because you couldn't even protect your husband. So can you protect somebody else? But the Devadasi originally, the 
first marriage ceremony and that you can find in Nitya Sumangali is an identification with the goddess. She is not married to Murugan. She is married to his Kattari, which is his dagger, his dagger. And the weapons of a god are actually aspects of his Shakti, of his female side. And the marriage ceremony is conducted with a dagger. And the Karbadanam, which is a sanskara, is imagined to be she sleeps with a dagger. So there you see the heavy symbolism of actually being emerged and empowered by the goddess. And once this marriage is over, and that's the real the tying of the bottle by grandmother sister, it's a female affair. It's a girl who is merged with a goddess, and it is her family, her grandmother's sister, who is tying the, the marriage cord. Then in the evening, she's taken to the temple, and there she is dedicated to Murugan. And that dedication is a dedication that she has the right to perform, and the proficiency to perform Kumbharati. And for that reason, she is branded. She is branded with a Trishula. Now, this is all very kind of extreme. I don't think any of the brides would like to be branded by the signature of their husband on the right arm with a hot iron. So this is the situation. So the whole idea of a marriage that got the public imagination that oh, she is married to the God and that is why she is ever auspicious. Isn't it blissful? No, it is not so blissful because first of all, she is not married to the God directly. She is married to his dagger and she is dedicated to work in the temple. And actually this branding ceremony is for more people who work in the temple who are branded, even Shankar Chakra in Vaishnava tradition, it also happens. So the Devadasi marriage is complex. It is a vivaha, it is a sanskara, as it should be understood in Indian terms. It is not a marriage, married, not married, in, again, uh, the kind of Western terms and the Western romance and the Western appreciation of either you made it or you somehow missed the bus. Okay, the last question, that is Lakshmi's question. Now, maybe when I explain, you know, what is the core competence of a Devadasi, and that is Kumbharati, mm -hmm. taking away the evil eye through the Kumba, the fire, and the rotation, uh, the triple rotation. Now, actually, you may aspire to do that, but then, of course, there is a very strong application ceremony of half a year, procedure of half a year. And these families, they had rights. They had right for a house, for land, for living in Melita Tirutami. So they wouldn't give up that so easily. But it is known that this kind of Devadasi function, uh, it is open to many castes. Girls could be uh, kind of uh, either adopted or when they were lost, they could be kind of transformed into family members. There are many ways how a girl who is not Nitya Sumangali can turn into Nitya Sumangali. But it's basically a task connected with auspiciousness and auspiciousness in the sense is protecting against danger and spreading auspiciousness through the arts. So I'm sure that many modern persons would like to be connected with spreading the beauty of the arts and the spirituality as it is called nowadays, the auspiciousness of the arts. But would they be also be willing to connect to the Kumbharati? and to taking, taking away evil eye. There were royal descendants. There were Brahmin girls. There were, it, it is an open caste. But who wants to apply to branding? Mm -hmm. The answer is yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, uh, Akka, uh, I, you know, when Mahalaji and I were questions already. Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Ah. Okay, uh, so uh, when Mahalakshmi and I were, you know, mulling over which questions to ask you, because both of us had so many questions, uh, but we, when we, when we uh, narrowed down on these particular ones, um, where we, uh, we just thought that we'll go in a progression where we talk, where we bring this conversation to the modern day. And um, actually, the reason why we're asking this question also is that someone from one of the viewers, Kirtana, who's also a dancer, she's asked this question as well. So we thought that we'd ask this. What would you say to 
modern day bharatnatyam dancers uh, regarding um, their approach to this dance form in the absence of the ritual function that was so vital to the devadasi tradition this is of course um a very very um difficult question because um we are talking about a figure who has been highly romanticized Mm. Um, the Devadasi reality was not romantic. The Devadasi reality was extremely rich, but you have to choose or you have to be born into that richness. And much of that richness has ended in 1947. As the Devadasis had their kind of hereditary rights, they, it's called Mure, the right to perform, that Mure has ended. Actually, who nowadays, if we look, you know, at the stage, who is the director? Who is the designer? The patron? Who is the public? What is the audience? What is the venue? These are all very important kind of aspects of a production. Very often nowadays, there is no designer. The dancer is her own designer. And who is the director? Very often it's also the dancer who tries to be her own director because where is the director? I mean, there, there is no central kind of coordination of either quality control or of auditioning. It is an open space. It is a completely open space. And very importantly, you know, I'm a little bit playing now with the ideas of Peter Brook. It's called the empty space. Uh, very important for an art to flourish is the audience. The audience has to have a thirst, a daham, a thirshna. What really is the, the reason why people would come to a performance? Is there a shared aesthetics? And as India turned in 1947 an open society, this horizon of a cosmology opened up to a much broader public than the original Rasikas, or to the patron, or to kind of set stages either in the court or in the temple or in the village, depending on what kind of performing arts you're. And modern dancers have to uh, kind of experiment with all these dimensions and have to find their way in this. But I think uh, it is not that they have to work from a vacuum. I feel that in this 2000 years of poetry, whether it is Sanskrit poetry or other regional poetry, Tamil poetry, there is such a rich array of emotional material. And when I think, this is a personal opinion, uh, when I think of Bharatanatyam, basically, it derives from Shringara. Shringara is the main emotion. And within Shringara, all the emotions, other emotions can find a place. Anger, happiness, uh, the disappointment, disgust even to some extent, but fear, humor. Ultimately, it, it all works into lyrical poetry. Now, lyrical poetry is basically introspective. And it is who is not kind of involved in the quest of love. Even if you not, do not take it as bhakti, this is such a human emotion that it really can be uh, deployed through different languages, through different poetry, and most importantly, to music. If you think of the rich array of rakti ragas that are really strong in emotional effect, there is no agenda in music. There is no agenda in rakti. Rakti gets under your skin or it doesn't. But music is extremely important. So this is open to today as well. And this can be investigated and this can be, this lyrical kind of track can be followed up even in the 21st century. If you think of Tamil poetry, it is anonymous. It says the Sangam poetry, what he said, what she said. Now, if you take this further into the bhakti kind of uh, Srangara bhakti, these kind of compositions are anonymous as well because actually you are using names of gods and situations of gods it's very interesting to to think of that it creates an anonymity of yourself 
these compositions and this artistic endeavor is not about you as an artist. It is about you meditating upon what is the emotional effect that is happening here. And that can be done in many ways. You can lift it out of that kind of agenda of the Jitvatma and Paramatma, because actually that is what that was it was not for that at all in the beginning. You know, in the Devadasi does not think about that. It's an agenda which uh, I now I turn political, so I switch off this in myself quickly. <laughs> it is deeply orientalist and it doesn't help you young people because that mythology has worn out, I'm afraid. But love hasn't worn out. Music hasn't worn out. So there is so much, you know, to discover and to create. And I think there is a lot of freedom the, the moment you take it. And you have to find a kind of environment of new rasikas. There has to be a public. You cannot play for empty halls. And there has to be a kind of, um, how should I say it, quality control that is connected with opportunities and with funding. But that is a kind of professionalization that is taking place, hopefully. But it is in the hands of this younger generation to create what is not available now. I, I, I can extend on this because I think this is just one genre. You know, if you take the lyri lyrical genre, if you feel that you want to have a kind of social relevance and you want to have social messages, mm -hmm. this is actually a, a different genre. When we talk about it as a genre, you know, I, I'm not talking about being on fire with a political agenda and you have to do this because it is your directive. No, let's talk about it a little bit depersonalized. This is a heroic genre. And of course, the heroic genre, even if you have it, Agam, Puram, Shrangara, Veera, it needs a narrative. The Shrangara doesn't need a narrative. The Shrangara needs introspection. So Shrangara to be a narrative kills it. But the heroic genre, that needs a narrative. And that needs more kind of um, dramatis personae who play out the different roles. That's very well possible. I mean, in the past, it has been there. I mean, there is Kate Kutu, Teru Kutu, there is um, Bhagavatamela, there is Yakshagana. I mean, this is another genre, but it's very fertile. And that's also not gone. You can make it your own. But don't use the lyrical for the heroic. Or don't start the heroic in lyrical terms. So this Agam, Puram, Shrangara, Veera, that is a continuation, but it is up to creative young people to handle it, to see the wealth of the past and to turn it into something new or to look elsewhere. Because, I mean, I think this is a global theme, love and heroism. You can dance to Greek, you can dance to Japanese, you can dance whatever, but know what you're dancing about, be moved by it be affected by it. The whole idea of creating rasa is the most important. And rasa can come through many angles. But create an experience. OK? Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Akka. That was a lovely, uh, lovely answer for, to a question that I'm sure many, many dancers today are uh, seeking answers to. So thank you for that. Um, we'd like to uh, from the audience. So yeah, take maybe a, one or a few questions. I have one question from Bhargavi Gopalan. Uh, Bhargavi, I'm reading it out. Uh, it's faster that way. Uh, in the current world, uh, if one is interested in researching on the Devadasi system or lifestyle, how does one start this process? Because access to the, these women or their narratives is not available much. So where do we start? I think you start with looking around because this is a presumption that it is not much. but these people have not disappeared from the globe. You know, go to Kumbakonam, go to Tiruvarur, go to Mayuram, go to Tanjur. They are alive and they're very willing to share. You know, what we did in this kind of residency program of Yatra, we have been living in Tirupuvalur, but moving to Tanjur 
uh, stopping in Kumbakonam, ending in Chidambaram, and everywhere you find remnants of that old world, of Gurukas who remember, of Nagasura players who have repertoire, of uh, in how descendants of active Devadasi dancers and, and Natuanas. So it is really a matter of field work going into the Kaveri belt for the typical South Indian version, but you can find it in Andhra Pradesh, in Telangana, you can find it in Karnataka. So it is a matter of search and you will find. It, they are not main stage. That is the sad thing that um, the Devadasi heritage was not only forbidden to have its original function in the temples. The temple kind of function was uh, cancelled by the Devadasi Act, which is very interesting because uh, the constitution, the Indian constitution says that it doesn't mix and mingle into religious matters, but that is what actually they did. Three months after independence, they forbade Devadasis to participate in uh, Hindu ritual. So this is a short uh, kind of cut to when the rift started. But if you go into the field, you will find their descendants. Tanjur is full of it. And there is a lot of knowledge. And they are trying really to create festivals like the Chinamelam festival. The families are there. And of course, there is discussions. You know, I, I do not want to name call names because then we create preferences and uh, antagonisms. But it is clear that this is a theme that is actual. So follow the leads. They are talking, they are there, they are dancing, but they are not mainstream because of the Devadasi Act and because of that aspect that I have discussed, that it is a very hidden agenda which was un kind of welcome to modern Indians to think in terms of auspiciousness as protecting against danger. But it doesn't mean that they are not there. They are there and they have knowledge. So find them. Uh, I have a question from someone. Uh, Anish Raghavan, would you like to ask your question? Is Anish still there? Anish, if you're if you're there, uh, you'll have to unmute. <laughs> yeah, namaste. Namaste. Uh, it was really very, very uh, uh, insightful all that you said. But I just have a question regarding uh, the songs, which are based on Shringara, and which are uh, directed to the god, the deity. When you spoke about the Devadasis being married to uh, weapon. Mm -hmm. How are these songs in their uh, in in their whole uh, uh, performance? How is it justified? What is the idea behind this idea of love to the deity himself? Uh, it's an interesting that this has been asked before, but they're in another form. Whether actually there are padams in Tirutani on Murugan? No, there are no Murugan padams. And the bhakti doesn't take the form of Shringara to Murugan. The whole idea that uh, while performing a padam, you create a relationship between yourself and the murti, the existing or the present god, is really a kind of imbalanced one. It is out of proportion. Because the Ranganaiti actually performed uh, Shringara padams, and they were Chetraya padams, because actually, her task was to create the mood, the vasanas, the environment of Shringara, the sensitivity of Shringara. Why? Because these situations speak, the Shringara situations speak about the god and the goddess. It's all about their marriage. It's all about them getting together. And it is the Devadasi's task to bring this into bhavana so that people experience their presence actually they see the god they see the goddess and they see how actually they are in love and how they are quarreling for instance when murugan marries bali devasena is is angry and she slams the door shri karamoga bahiriti avachalakiya devasena chalakiya devasena 
And he says, why do you slam the door on me? I, you are my darling. Of course, he just married Vali. But now he is kind of easing up Devasena so that she opens the door. So it is not about the Devadasi having a relationship with Murugan. It is about the Devadasi creating the presence of Murugan now as the lover of Devasena and the, the husband of Vali, the fresh husband of Vali. When we are talking about uh, the dagger, that it is because he is a Vira. Mangalam, Mangalam, Jaya, Mangalam. Jaya Padivela, Nayaguna Shila. And this is, he, they are singing about the auspicious Murugan, who is Jaya. And why do they say that? Because in the Nichiro Tsava, he has again to fight against all these demons, and they cannot get to sleep if they are around and alive. So Jaya Vadivela and the weapons are there before he enters into the bedroom. So this for you is mind boggling. We are talking about Sringara. You bring in a dagger. I sing for you a dagger. Uh, you ask about the Sringara and I bring in Devasena and Bali. And whom do I not bring in? The Devadasi. The Devadasi is a ritual specialist. And her task is to make the God felt. His presence should be felt. The goddess should be felt. It is about the gods, not about the Devadasi as an individual. Do you get this answer? Yes, thank you so much. It's, it's very clarifying. Thank you. You're mute. You're I'm... on mute. No. Okay, while Mahalakshmi is... Uh getting unmuted. Uh, Lavanya, would you like to ask your question? <laughs> She's on mute. No, I said there was Balakrishnan and Raghavan. Maybe Lavanya goes first and then Balakrishnan asks. Uh, yeah. And we'll... yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Namaskaram, Akka. Okay. And uh, thank you, Adhani, for giving such a wonderful experience. Uh, Akka, my question is, I'm hailing from Kerala. And often since my childhood, I've seen Tantrikam being uh, used by <coughs> sorry, Nambudris and the male Shantis within the Sanctum Santorum towards the presiding deity. And mm -hmm. every time that I got a chance, uh, uh, I, could, I could actually see them using our Hasta Mudras, both from the Abhinay Darpana as well as the Hasta Lakshana. Mm -hmm. Now my question is this, that did this come in from what the Devadasis had the potency to, uh, uh, you know, uh, their skill towards controlling the almighty, like you said, is this, is this something that the, uh, the, uh, the Nambudris picked from there? Or was this a separate sector altogether and was amalgamated? Or uh, how did this, uh, this happen, if I could ask? Well, I think, you know, there are um, kind of two ways of answering this question because it's a historical question and it's a regional question. And the regional question, I'm, I must say, I, I really like the information uh, about um, Kerala and the kind of um, Agamic temples there. Uh, but I can tell you how this use of pastas by the priest and how this was kind of oscillating between Devadasis and the priest is that you find um, in the 18th century, uh, 19th century murals, you find reference to Kaikatum Murei. Now, Kaikatum Murei is a Murei of showing hands. And it is very interesting that um, it is contested who actually are the priests who are performing in Agamic temples. Because we think of them as Adi Shaivas, as Gurukas. But of course, there's also Pandarans. And there is also the voice that actually Devadasis were into the right in front of the Garbhagraha, they were performing actually rites directly for the god. The Kaikatu Murei shows a, a situation where the Devarasis were not in direct contact with the Garbhagraha, but a little bit at a distance, and they showed what the priest was doing, the different Upacharas, the Raja Upacharas, then, um, you know, the 16 Raja Upacharas, or the kind of smaller quantity, by hands, so the Chamra, the Chatra, the, the Deepam, Tattu Deepam, uh, Ratta Deepam, 
they would show it by hands to the devotees because not everybody could be right there at the Gargot Bridge, a very small place. So everybody was given the possibility through again, it comes back again and again, through bhavana, through imagination, such a strong imagination that although you're at a distance, the bhavana brings you close. So there is this kind of stream of performing in front of the God and almost being there, only very few gurus can touch the God, can touch the murti. But those who cannot touch, they can send the kind of signals of what is going on in a chain of a kind of servants, other servants, dedicated servants for the public at large. I hope this is to some extent an answer because I can talk about the Kerala situation, but I can talk about what I have seen in Tiruvarur and in other places in Tamil Nadu. Is this okay? Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much, Akka. Thanks a lot. Okay, thank you. I think we have Balakrishnan's question. Manakam. Uh... Manakam. Uh... We can hear, can you. hear me. Yeah. Lovely, love. Uh, so, um, I just wanted to ask you part two. It's a two part question if you have the time. So, uh, one is about uh, how much were, uh, for example, Telugu Padams for uh, of Annamaya or someone part of the Tiruvaru tradition, or there was none much. Uh, uh, there were more about uh, Tamil compositions and compositions of Kshetraya and stuff around uh, Tiruvaru uh, in the Devadasi repertoire. or uh, that was a question. And the other thing uh, is uh, regarding the uh, regarding your current work, I just, uh, word sound image, Nitya Sumangali, Bhuga Shakti, is there a book coming up of Bhuga Shakti at some point other than the 10-page article that you've written? Just thanks, if you'd like oh. to share. Um, well, I think um, we do not know much about the padams that were performed in Piruvaru, but for actually the Melakaram Periyamelam repertoire. And uh, I am uh, kind of noting uh, to uh, not completely, but there is a great amount of information in Nitya Sumangri about the Lechapa repertoire, uh, which is performed uh, in part still in Tiruvaru. And there are padams. But these poems are indeed in Tamil, and sometimes composers are not even known. When we are talking about Tirutani, this is of course on the border of Andhra Pradesh. Tirutani is basically bilingual. Uh, Ranganaiki emphasized that they only performed Kshetraya Padams, not earlier Padams, Kshetraya Padams. And it is very interesting to, to see how uh, scholars are trying to create um, new. Um, how should I say it, uh, networks of affinity or kind of um, collaboration. Although Tirutani is on the border of uh, Andhra Pradesh, on the border of uh, uh, Tamil Nadu, that kind of dual situation, Ranganaiki's orientation was uh, towards Tanjur. The Pushmanjali that you have heard was taught to her by her grandmother, Suburatnamma, who wrote her repertoire in the 19th century, uh, and it has padams, but indeed there is mostly uh, Kshetraya padams. But this Pushpanjali was taught to her um, by Arunachila Pillay from Tanjur. <laughs> it's really interesting that this Tirutani tradition is really related actually to the Tanjur quarter, one generation after the Tanjur quarter. But the Padams that you find have this kind of total connection to the Telugu area, but of course Telugu being the court language, and exclusively, almost exclusively, uh, Kshetaya Padams. Of course, they had different functions, um, and either were kind of... Uh, let's say, beyond Nitya Archana and Nainiti Karcha, the daily and the festival puja social functions, there was a much broader repertoire of joke songs and even of grandmother's Sonta Kavitvam, her own Kavitvas, her own poems, but not Anamachari. For the repertoire that you are inquiring about, uh, it is 
Chaitreya. In that function, I can only say Ranganayaki was empathic about Chaitreya. So you are interested about what I am working on actually right yes. now? Okay. So basically, um, uh, when I went to Sumangali, um, a few years later, the whole of Indology was dismantled uh, because of economic scarcity. And I had to reinvent myself. And the reinvention of myself took, took the shape of questioning actually literacy. The basis of academic life is literacy, reading and writing. But Devadasis did not read and write, although they could write. It was not their way of transmitting their knowledge. There was really a performance was the full form of knowledge. And if you want to really understand the impact of the art, you have to know music, you have to know dance, you have to be there. And the written word is only a memory aid. So that kind of questioning, that was a real critical intervention into the academic world of literacy, took the form of word sound image. Then I got myself into linguistic anthropology. That was my next, uh, next invention, sound invention, which I did for 10 years. But uh, I was tossed around uh, between all types of political agendas. And of course, my political, my ag I'm notoriously uh, polit politically incorrect. I don't subscribe to writing a book with a political agenda, definitely not at the time. What I did had political impact, but in a different way. So uh, I was very happy to get back to the humanities. But when I got back from social sciences to the humanities, uh, that was 2000, 2001, uh, that was musicology and theater studies, there they had discovered Edward Said. So again, the kind of social paradigm and social critique had entered, and that was scholarship. So I was very happy to take leave of academic life in 2013, and now I have again time. So what I couldn't finish in, in 1985, 86, 87, Ranganaiki's repertoire and uh, Suburat Namas manuscript, I'm working on that. Mm -hmm. I'm teaching uh, Ranganaiki's repertoire, what she has taught me, which is about 50 compositions from daily and from festival puja to a select group of students. And in arranging residencies either in India or in Legend. And we are working and I am in a very um, kind of cordial relationship with other hereditary dancers uh, to work towards an edition of Ranganaiki's repertoire. Hopefully, again, with Motila Banasi does, but give me some time. Okay. Uh, thanks Thank so much for that, Akka. Uh, Dr. Yashoda Thakur wants to uh, also respond to your question, um, uh, Balakrishnan. So I'm going to hand, uh, hand over the mic. Can to speak pin to you. her? Is it okay? Or Shall, I her? Shall I pin her as well? Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I, yeah, I added her as well. Okay. Ma yeah, go ahead, Dr. Ma Yashoda. Ma'am, first of all, Namaskaram to you. And uh, I just wanted to say about that Anamaya question. Uh, there are inscriptions which talk about a lot of Devadasi activity in the Tirumala temple during Anamaya's time. And in fact, uh, when you look at his songs, it shows that he was inspired by the courtesans when he wrote them. I don't even want to use the word courtesans here, but by the Devadasis, by the dancers of the temple. But then Anamaya locked them up in that in that little place in Tirumala because of the Mughal rule at that time. He wanted to keep them safe and he locked them up and they were found only much later after Andhra Pradesh was formed. You know. So there was no access. If the, if the hereditary dancers did not dance to them, I think it's mostly because they didn't have access to the songs. Uh, Shetraya was there, just out there everywhere. That's one thing. Ma'am, I also wanted to ask you about the Baliharana part of it, ma'am. The I think it's called Navasandhi in that area. If there is any insight you can give us about Baliharana. Uh, well, the insight which I can give you from the experience in Tirutan is very meager. Because uh, she said that in Ranganaiki said that in her time it was not performed at all. And in the time of grandmother. Suburat Namma, 
it had dwindled to just ta te te ta du te te ta ta te te ta du te te ta avluda that's it so just that. just that so what what we find in tanjur uh, is although they have this kind of horizon looking to the south to tanjur they didn't inherit or didn't keep up that kind of baliharana navasambhi kautam which you find in agamas which we find in other temples perhaps in the kaveri belt in tirutani it was no longer there so the life experience or the life kind of data from the field is just ta te te ta de te apoya de ta te te ta de te te ta I actually wanted to ask uh, in th on that note with respect to Kautvam being a part of the Baliharana, uh, how uh, when did it get in? How did it get incorporated into the Sadhir Kacheri, or did it uh, because uh, originally we meant for a ritual, or, but later in the Sadhir format we do see the Kautvam, right? Uh, uh, that's a matter of uh, of actually choice after 1947. and it has of course the field work is very well known uh, especially the editing with by jantimala uh, and that of course it caught the fever of the ancient means in the devadasi background and especially not performed by devadasis but by new dancers that is where you see the overflow of a ritual dance into the proscenium theater but in the court it was not performed during Mahotsava, Brahmotsava, it used to be performed, and the kind of margam was performed during Brahmotsava. But these are preparatory rites of a Brahmotsava, which were highly secretive, and again dealing, you know, with danger, appeasing the gods on the territory. As you know, in Natya Shastra, the first Natya was destroyed or disturbed because. There was no baliharana. There was no kind of propitiation of the gods or the, the forces around the performance. And Brahma said, "Let's do something about it. Let there be a, uh, let there be a stage and a stage house and purvarangas." So kautrams belong to the genre of purvarangas, so that nobody disturbs the ongoing festival. But it caught the fancy, like Malari. It was not meant to be danced. Malari is a Periyamelan composition, which is actually a wrestler's kind of image. This was music performed for wrestlers, and they are challenging the god to get out of the Devasriya Mandapa into the Eastern Gate and get into the Grama, get into the Viti. And this ta 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 ta. It is a wrestler's movement. It is not for dance, but it got the invention. Anything goes. That was what Ranganayake said. Now every anything goes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Aranyani, uh, yeah, Mahad, you want to? Oh, okay. You want me to ask? Yeah. So uh, we have uh, four more. Qu I think two questions more. Uh, but so depending on how uh, do you want to? Uh, does the audience have time? Do you all have time to listen to two more questions and answers, or do we close and get them emailed and get Saskia Akka to answer? So we've left it to you now. It's been one and a half years since we've started. Yeah. Also, please keep in mind that we also, after Saskia Akka's question answer session, we also want to have a small discussion. Um, so I, I, it has been one and a half hours, but uh, just yeah. yeah. If you could just raise your hands and let us know if you're okay, okay to pass the time you want. To. <laughs> you know, I'm very happy to take two more questions. No problem. Okay. No, but of course, uh, you know, you have to have your time limit and you have your own program. If you yeah. don't work out to take two more questions, I would like to say that in next weekend, uh, I will have another discussion uh, in the context of Virkya Bhoga, and it is a Bhoga Shakti. The silent witness to the life of Devadasis. There is again an opportunity to ask questions. So uh, I'm very willing to take them now. I'm willing to take them then. 
and even Nataki is organizing some kind of question and answer sessions. So. Okay, Aka, I think then we'll, we'll I, I'll ask these two questions because they've been asked, they, they've asked me to ask them on behalf of them because they cannot answer the, they can't be on the microphone for some reason. I can understand if they have small children or something, then maybe they can't really be on, uh, on speaker. Now, one of the questions is from Deepika. She says, Namaskaram Akka, my question is, was there hierarchy in the Devadasi system? Did they have different roles and parts of the temple where they performed? Uh, actually, yes. I mean, it's a very complex system and it is internally hierarchical. And uh, I think for that, it would be best because I'm trying to make a shortcut now. Yes. To, to see the Tiruvaru situation where there is really an inventory of the different types of uh, Devadasis. And, um, you know, when Nitya Sumangali appeared, actually it worked like a map, a map of the territory of the concept. And many people after me have taken up to travel that map and to produce different studies. And studies have appeared in the term of the sociology, but also legal studies, um, history studies, and especially epigraphy. There have been many epigraphical studies uh, like Leslie Gors, and there you can really find the richness of the system and its hierarchic orders. So, uh, because we are in a bit of a uh, short kind of dare scarcity of time, I refer to Nitya Sumangali itself, especially the Tiruvaru sections, and to the scholarship which ensued after they went after Nitya Sumangali. Yeah, also, I think for this, these answers actually are very uh, well uh, thought or explained in the book itself. And, yeah. and each era has its, has had its own stratifications, according to Akka. The Chola period, the stratification was different from the, from the Tiruvarur and so on. So, yeah, you should, I mean, this, I hope you all read, really read the book after, at least after this. Yeah, yeah I was also just going to say that, uh, that actually that, that question is answered really, really well in the book. So... Uh, I mean, this is just one more reason to pick up the book and read it. Uh, I There's one more question that um, I was hoping that she'll answer, that she'll ask it herself, but she hasn't asked, uh, she hasn't responded to that. She says, uh, this is Amrita Shruti. She asks, oh, God, where are they? there are so many questions. Um, my question is this, you mentioned about quality control that is perhaps important to understand the process of dance from its historical emergence to now. Can you please share some insights into how quality was preserved while the Devdasis were dancing as compared to the current times? Um, of course, there, there is a grading system and there is a failing system. And uh, you have seen, um, perhaps the video which was shared, where I danced to Ranganaiti's voice for Pushmanjali. And you can see that actually the steps are very, very simple. When, uh, when I was studying with my teacher, Nandini Ramani, Bala Saraswati style, um, Ganesha was there, Kandapa Ganesha's son, Ganesha Pili. And he saw, he asked me to, to dance this Pushmanjali and I danced the Pushmanjali. And he said, this is very simple but very elegant. So the, you, what you should kind of imagine the Devadasi art, the performing art of the dance in the temple, a temple like Tirutani, it didn't have the kind of uh, excellence or how should I say it, the kind of uh, sophistication that we see nowadays on the physical culture of dance. Uh, it's very often the case that when uh, a performing art is cut out of its natural environment, which is either a folksy environment or a ritual environment, and turned into an art form, a proscenium art form, um, incredible complexity and, um, how should I say, chiseling takes place. And highly professionalization. We saw this in ballet. If you think what was danced by Marie Taglioni, and the Russian dancers at the season in the Tsar mm. court. And even when it got to places like, for instance, the Netherlands, or it was professional, but not what you find now in the Royal Ballet 
or in the American Ballet Theater or any of the major companies of classical ballet. And I think this is a situation that the form is chiseled into a real diamond, but it may also become too much of form, a formalistic performance. And this kind of quality control in the case of ballet is, is very, very strong by conservatories and by auditions and a yearly checkup where dancers are graded and they are either promoted or demoted. After 1947, nothing like that existed. It has come to into existence, which is a central organization where there is a quality of control of the curriculum, of uh, auditions for companies, of yearly checks of the professionality of dancers. So I wouldn't look for quality control uh, in the Devadasi kind of past, I would rather look for quality control in contemporary India, like it is in other places of professional dance in the world. And it is shaping, but it is very important for people to get opportunities based on qualification and talent and not on network. Uh, I have a question uh, from Vaishnavi. Uh, uh, she says, did Devadasis have a choice of becoming one or not? Or was it hereditary? And had they, uh, and they had to become one if their mother was one? Was it hereditary? But I think we have sort of answered this. Uh... Yes, because you know, I, I just want for a moment. I want to react to this because nowadays uh, there's a, a big discussion about Devadasis. Devadasis. It's like, you know. Um, the oil that spills over water. It is an immense container term by now. Everything goes into that term. And, and my research has actually been about an agamic and royal background. And this, of course, was a privilege in the sense it was labor, it was a livelihood. And it was securing a livelihood. Ranganaiki was one out of seven girls. And she was the one who was dedicated to the temple. And this was a right they kept, with, because of that reason, the house in Upper Tiritani lands, the possibility of, uh, it was not paid in money, but in Natura, and a dignity. It was a dignity of, that is what Ranganaiki was, that we had our own Murei. And it's interesting also to, to see, that is also again Ranganaiki's words from 1947 Tiritani, that two months before the Devadasi Act was passed, there was a complete influx or a horde of immense demand of girls from Devadasi families to be branded. Because at least in this way, they would have statues. And the difficulty is that when the kind of Devadasi Act abolished a structural place within the Hindu system, for Devadasis, they didn't have a follow-up or a kind of rescue system, what can be done, how they can be given a new kind of um, professional statute. So all these questions then become shifting. Uh, it was a privilege to be a Devadasi in the Agama temple or at the royal court. Then we are talking about the Lamadasi or yogis, yogis, or other kind of rights that still continue, it's a totally different question. And we shouldn't mix the two because the gods are different, the rights are different, the necessity is different because Devadasis were in the court and in the temple, not out of poverty or not out of social pressure. They were there because it was part of, it is very interesting. That's my, I think I close with this. When a god is invited in a temple, first there has to be a murti. The murti is made. It is ordered, it is chiseled, it is brought into the temple. And then, of course, there are the rites, the avahana, to invite the god to take place into the murti. Very important in that murti is his layangas, the angas, his limbs, by which you can recognize him. How many arms does he have? Does he have this floating hair? Uh, what weapons does he have? These are his layers of his function. 
And then the other part is his Bhogangas. Both are the limbs of his Bhoga, of his happiness that he has descended here in this or that temple on earth. He should be happy. And his Bhogangas, that is his Paricharakas, his servants around him. So it is the Guruka, the Oduvar, the Devadasis who made the God happy and willing to stay. This as such is a beautiful function, but for that one has to apply. And there were many ways how to apply, but of course, Mure, family heritage rights, they came first. Maybe this is a way of answering. And in this old setting, it pro produces a kind of horizon, which is no longer valid for contemporary dancers because they don't have a mure, they don't have a function in the temple, they don't aspire to have a function, they wouldn't be accepted. The only mure is the stage, but that has to be arranged, still professionally. <laughs> uh, one last question from Sanjukta Vak. Aranyani, can I go? Go for it, go for it. Yeah, so I find it very fascinating, uh, the point about combating danger. In these dangerous times, I'm curious to know more about how the Devadasis combated danger. Were they healers? Did they predict, as, uh, did they predict like astrologers or through their performances? And were all sections of society be able to access them or was it restricted to the patrons, kings and priests? Am I clear? So, in part, you know, in the host social stratification that you will find in Nitya Sumangali, because the Maapangi is available in the village. Mm -hmm. But the kind of um, labor of uh, Nitya Sumangali Devadasi, that is an earlier question of yours, I speak about Devadasi Nitya Sumangali as belonging to an Agamic temple or a royal court. So, what I have seen, again, I go back to my field work, is of course it was no longer allowed to officiate mm -hmm. like this. But Ranganaiki was still officiated. I have seen, she took me to people who had asked her help. A lady had severe headaches and was confused. And she did Drishti Parihara for that lady. So she had her own ways uh, of uh, soil and of arati. And this is not very different of what nowadays is performed by Tamil women. But usually it is an older lady who is post, who no longer menstruates. It is either pre-pubertal or post-menopause because the danger of life and death, which is the menstrual blood, which is birth and everything that is connected with that, you shouldn't mix that. So either a young girl or a lady who no longer menstruates, they can do it. But the Devadasi could do it because of her deep chance that we have discussed. And she would do it in the village. She would do it for patrons. She would do it for people who come to the temple. And it basically would be fire. It would be um, lemon, uh, charcoal, and then of course, kumkumam, or mud and storing the mud behind. This is what she even did for me. When I uh, had walked in the village, I came home by about 12 o'clock. And I was a bit dizzy and she said, oh, 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 that is a lot of Krishna because you are too fair. Yes, I'm terribly fair. I'm too fair. So that fairness of mine was dangerous. And that is why I didn't feel well. And she did Drishti Parihara for me. But other women in Tamil Nadu had done Drishti Parihara for me, postmenopausal women. It's very important. And it is performed in America. It is performed in England, I'm sure of it. But that was the, the kind of core competence of Devadasi that she could do that successfully, not as an act of goodwill, but it worked. Okay? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, do, yeah, so before we close, we really want to interact with the audience on how they felt about the book or how much, uh, or how the book, how, did, how they got to know about the book. But I think we'd like to invite Vaishnavi to say something, Aranyani. Yeah, no, no. I mean, I, I just, I was just thinking that like to say, Vaishnavi, if you would like to say something, we'd be really glad to hear if you're around. Um, yeah, sure. I'm around. Oh, hi. Uh, first of all, thanks to all three of you all. I really had a lot of tears in my eyes throughout. Um, so I don't know what you would like to like me to share. Uh, no, because you said you're not allowed. No. To 
yeah, yeah so it was just that in my family it's a, a shunned conversation so i would come across dead ends when i would talk about this so this was like an opening for really getting to know about my heritage so thank you so much i was just going to say yashoda ka would have yeah yashoda ka would you like to say something yeah. yeah in fact because of her i'm here so thanks a lot yashoda it was by chance that i met her on facebook and i'm here and i'm really very really happy to know more about uh, and just to give a background to ma'am uh, ma'am vaishnavi got in touch on the facebook with some of the posts and she messaged me saying she's from the community from the hereditary family and quickly we got in touch her family there are dancers in her family ma'am vaishnavi if you tell a little bit about your great grandfather great grandmother aunt ma'am yeah. would know and the other the names maybe Sure. So my uh, grand aunt was Tia Rajkumari, who shifted into acting. So she was the one who moved from uh, the Devdasi culture to getting into acting. Uh, but it pretty much stopped over there. So she was the head of our family, and um, she did not like any of us to get into any kind of dance or any art form. um it it was like a complete block after her. So she kind of dedicated her life to bringing all of us up. um and she was very successful as an actress uh, along with her sisters uh, but it, nothing of this was spoken it it was uh, you're not supposed to talk even i got to know about this maybe when i was a teenager or late teens that we belong to the devdasi heritage and it is still not accepted to speak even if i ask my current aunts they're like Shh, don't talk about that <laughs> but but there's a fire yeah there's a fire in me to really know a lot and I'm, and I'm, it's really um interesting Could i ask you a question i'm sorry if you, and please don't uh, don't feel compelled to answer any of our questions <laughs> yeah but um uh, but uh, do you do you dance no that's what so even uh, so that's what i was telling yashoda one of my greatest regret is not learning bharatnatyam but even when i did have that uh, desire to learn it as a child it was not encouraged by the family mm-hmm. Uh, paradoxically she has a few cousins who are learning the modern day bharatanatyam now hmm. like anybody else right interesting, interesting yeah mm-hmm. uh does uh, anybody else want to say something about the book itself uh, uh who, anyone here who's read we'd really love to know kitna <laughs> <laughs> she has read the book and she's very excited about it uh, it's okay this is uh, like uh, you know meeting the author of a book is not a dream that we that i would have seen coming true especially an author of a bharatanatyam book and uh, thank you uh, saskia ka because you bought in i mean for me uh, i only learned the performative side of bharatanatyam and it was much later that i started thinking and reading up about dance I mean, Bharat and Atim to be more specific, and it was only because I had to give an exam. Uh, I stumbled on your book much, much later when I had already my theories in my head and I had kind of envisioned my art form to be in such a way. So I really value the scholarship that you brought into this book. The fact that you did uh, primary and secondary research, because somewhere that made me really think that this is beyond. Uh, a performative aspect that is beyond uh, uh, learning and performing on stage because of the because of the research work that you have uh, very very beautifully shared and uh, collected and even uh, given us information and to reiterate what aranyani said this was not an easy book to read and complete and i think uh, i am on my second or third time reading and i am feeling like this is the first time i'm reading the book so i hope that maybe the 10th time i I would have some I would retain some things of what what I read but uh, thank you for bringing in this level of scholarship to the art form and making a person like me believe that there's more to uh, to our history and sociology of Bharatanatyam so thank you thank you really there's someone Nicole who wants to share yeah yes thank you everyone it's wonderful and thank you to Saskia ji for uh, telling me about this event I want to share my experience. I read Nitya Sumangali um, as part of 
the residency program that uh, Saskia was mentioning in Legend, Hungary. And I, I wanted to uh, acknowledge also what the others have said. The first time it was very dense reading because I didn't know all the words. Um, but what happened, I noticed, then we went and studied with Saskia and we went deeply into the music and the dance and the poetry. And I just recently read it again last year. And it was amazing to me the difference when I knew all the words. <laughs> it was so much easier to read it because I had had all that background context and all the cultural and all the words meant something. And so I think it's a very good book that would be read almost in conjunction with lectures from Saskia because when she speaks about it, it's so clear what the words are. But when you read it before, not knowing what those words are, there's not the, the context behind it that informs those words. So I feel like it would be a very powerful situation if you could have the book plus a, you know, like a lecture series or something together where the, the reader could also have that deep context built in through the lecture. So that was my experience. But I found it was very useful in framing the dance in a context so that you can then bring it somewhere because if you don't have the context, it lives in a vacuum. And so I think it's very useful for all the dancers to read that and have a, a common basis for discussion. But thank you also very much for this event. It's very blissful to, to see everyone and hear all this uh, questions are very good questions. Yeah. Thank you, Nicole. <laughs> yeah, and uh, anybody else has some, anything to say about the book or or, or generally about anything that was discussed today. Yeah, today. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, anything about what we discussed today. Actually, uh, Saskia Akka in the book, I think somewhere mentions that how for an untrained Western eye, the Hindu rituals are very complicated to understand and uh, uh, get context to. But I think it was true for me. I mean, as a, and in fact, I originally hail from Tirvarur, but... <laughs> Uh, so yeah, it, it was true for me. It, it's 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 very true for modern day uh, urban uh, Indians as well. I think uh, that yeah, is. no, and also for people who who uh, may not be uh, as engaged in ritual as yeah. uh, as as Indians of the past were, uh, uh, and many Indians today are very deeply engaged in ritual still, but many aren't as well. I mean, as we were also talking about, you know, how to approach approach Bharatanatyam from a secular perspective and all of that. A lot of, uh, in that situation, in that circumstance, the question of a ritual uh, becomes even more of an alien concept. Uh, but uh, yeah, so I agree with Mahalakshmi. It was it was uh, uh, and Nicole. It was something that yeah that that took a lot of reading and took a, took rereading and re uh, recognizing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, yes, Akka, please. Because, you know, I think, uh, you know, that I have been not only writing the book, but I have really, as Nicole says, uh, in Legend, I have organized residencies, but that helps on the level of, you know, art appreciation. But for Mahalakshmi, who is from Tiruvaru, that is really important, you know, to connect to the, to the work floor of Hinduism still in the field. Because actually, this old world in which Ganganayake at times was still a, a functional participant, it has not died, it continues. And the rituals, they really can tell you a lot. So if you do not just go there with a feeling of bhakti or looking for the Paramatma, look for what's going on and how complex and how rich it is and what it wants to do with you know, on its own purpose. What are the purposes that are emerging from the center, not from your imagination, but look what's going on on, I call it the work floor of Hinduism in the field. It is not that and gone. That world still exists. And that is why I had organized this Yatra and Mohamana workshop and the Bhogam, because it is very important. It has gone downstream or in an understream, in an underlayer, but that can always come to the surface again. Mm. And on that note, I'd like to read out something from the book which really stuck to me that the anti-Devadasi movement and anti-Notch movement destroyed the prominent class of Nitya Sumangalis. However, it did not remove the basic cultural motivation. I think that's where, uh, that, that still yeah, is what you're getting at. And I thought I should 
read that word sentence from the book <laughs> yeah shodaka has to yeah, yeah shodaka you wanted to say yeah I, I have a little child yelling so i hope that doesn't disturb you too much but ma'am i just wanted to ask you it's a it's a slightly hypothetical and stupid question but then do you think today in the temple this system this baliharana and the ritual should be reinstated by even if it's only by a sect of women not necessarily from the hereditary class by anybody do you think it should be reinstated no yes no Thank because you. if you take it seriously if you are a believer then these women who perform that should go to diksha if you don't believe it then perform it on stage Thank you. I I don't know. Maybe it's a little gross answer, but it's, it's what I feel. No, I I all from my side. I just feel it's a it's a complete commitment, ma'am. So yes. If you are not getting into that kind of commitment, you should not do that. And this difference between religion and secular for me, it never because when you get into the ritual and understand it, there is nothing religion and it's there's nothing limiting call religion it's so open it's so broad and it's all connected with nature and the universe so there is nothing about religion at all when you get into the meaning of the ritual and that's what you find with nitya sumangali when you read it but yashodaka isn't that kind of commitment true for any even say professional artist of today i mean that kind of dead um, it's true as i mean i'm not denying what you said but it is true for being on stage as well right mahalakshmi you're right you you need that temporal and physical commitment is one thing hmm. but commitment psychologically spiritually humanly you are committed to it which means you are living it there is no difference between your life and your art the art is you and it's not even called an art it's called your life there is no difference do do we live like that we they don't cut their hair because it's needed for dance they don't eat a certain food because they can they it's needed for dance that kind of life and i don't know if i'm qualified to talk after ma'am after so much research is here but am i right ma'am please correct me if i'm wrong definitely i think um You know, a lot of romanticization is going on about being a dancer, about imagining yourself to be a devadasi, or to feel deeply this history, and you imbibe it and you try to embody it. But these are all dreams. This is that is really a romanticism. And the devadasis, they had a devadasi vritti. It was a way of life. They danced because they lived on it, and it had, it had the dignity in society. It was a profession. dance music it was a profession so if you have this kind of professional kind of rootedness in a court or in a theater it could be today a theater and you can live on it without kind of network implications or without need to or whatever you know then you have a vritti you have a life and when it comes to ritual dance which is based on efficacy on ritual efficacy the ritual reaches a result and what is does it result in mangalam shubham the palashruti of the ritual is that the cow should bear calves the rice should grow the king should protect you should find a husband you should have a son a daughter mm. whatever that is the palashruti of the ritual so for that there was a professional group who was trained who got diksha who got dedicated who were living around the temple and they can do it because they are empowered but the situation of a uh, proscenium theater it is a different type of dedication it's also a vritti it's not a hobby and if there is a kind of environment where hobbies are a kind of portrayed and fest how should i say it um, celebrated that's good for who feels it but don't think that you are a devadas don't think that you are an artist like you know anna pavlova who lived only that or a valasaraswati who really was able to transform her art from tanju into a mercantile system 
and reaching all the way up to Wesleyan University. That was a professional core competence. That was also her life formula. So if you live on that core competence, if you're able to create life and your sustenance on earth, then that is a commitment. That's a vritti. That's a lifestyle. But it cannot be a hobby. It can be a hobby, but then experience it like that. Don't think that you are either a Bala Sosutura, Ranganai Tora, Anna Pavlova. Do you get my point? Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think uh, Devina, you, yeah, you she wanted to ask one last something. Yeah, I'm listening. Thank you so much for the opportunity to ask uh, this question and thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us. Um, so nowadays we're using the word Bharatanatyam, which I know is a very new relative, very new term um, as compared with uh, Sadir, Sadiratam and other, other similar words. Um, and we also see that there is a huge difference, uh, many uh, the difference of the purpose, the environment and everything that you just explained. But at the same time, there's so much which, which has been carried on and has been passed, passed on. Um, so I was wondering if you have an opinion or some thoughts as to whether it may be better to use the, use the appropriate word when referring to something of the past or use the appropriate word when using some, referring to the current day or the future um, or whether it is, it is fine to kind of use these words interchangeably. Well, I, I don't think you should use them interchangeably because why? Why should you do that? I think we are now in a 2000, uh, what is it, 20? Soon it will be 21. We are in a new situation compared to the situation before 1947. And Bharatanatyam has created really a life for itself. So I think for the present situation, it is good to use that term, but not forget that there was something like Dasi, Atam, Chinna, Melam, Sadir, you know, the different kind of uh, hereditary art forms. And if they continue, they should be named the way they are. But if you don't belong to that line, then create something new. And that kind of Bharatanatyam is, is basically something new. It works with the same ingredients of words, sounds, and images, and make this into a perfect jewel as an artist, not as a hobbyist, as an artist, learn music study the text, be involved in the poetry, get yourself into a body that is capable to move. You know, I mean, when some students come to my class and I, I see that they can't even turn out properly, but they dance. I mean, the injuries that are connected with that, there is a professionality. I remember that when I, for the first year I was in India and I was very silly and <laughs> I entered Balasras with his class and she was taming the students. You know, of course, I was making notes. I mean, master used to say, yes, yes, you dance in the book. <laughs> so making notes. So you have to really store in the mind and not making notes. So I asked her, what does she think about the future of Bharatanatyam? And you know, there is this <laughs> What is there? What is there? So what is there? She said, people have always danced they will dance. Of course, there will be dance because it is part of human nature to dance. And it's a beautiful talent we have innate, but make it professional, study it, give it what it takes. And then it gives back what you yearn for. Study, you know, be aware of your body, train it properly to turn out, to sit deep, to use the force of gravity, breathe, very important nowadays. Students are so tied up, they're almost hyperventilating. Keep a natural space, keep a natural pacing. It's very interesting to hear these old terms of panbu, natural, or of auchitya, you know, which is pleasing, like nature is pleasing. Get these qualities into your system and live them. So I think you've got it all. If even Balasaraswati was not afraid of the dance, in the future, why should you be afraid? Just think it professionally. Okay, did I deviate too far? Yes, <laughs> no, thank you. 
Well, actually, just to take that discussion further, uh, Davina, I was, uh, since you asked about the oneness and or differentiation between Bharatnatyam and uh, Sadir or Sadirattam, uh, I think that there's, uh, I think there's, a, there's an argument for the, for, for saying that they are actually very different forms. Um, the modern day Bharatnatyam that is performed today and practiced today is, is very, very different in, in its function, in its in the space in which it is performed, in the intent behind which performances happen, and all of that. So modern day Bharatanatyam is is absolutely a modern uh, construction, uh, whereas um, uh, Dasiyatam, Sadiratam, the other terms that you're using uh, in the question, they uh, they were the the they they were. The modern modern day Bharatanatyam is is sometimes informed by those, and actually not sometimes. I would say it's almost always, whether the dancers know it or not, is informed by by Sadir and the Devadasi um, dance uh, form that uh, that they call. I remember Dr. Yashoda also saying once that it's not, um, it didn't necessarily have one particular name. At uh, uh, it 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 was a dance form that the Devadasis danced. Uh, but today, given that we, what we now know as Bharatanatyam, I think is a modern construction. Um, so I would say that, that they are quite different, even though they do, um, I mean, that modern day Bharatanatyam does draw from uh, its roots, uh, the roots of the Devadasi tradition, but they are, they are quite distinct as dance forms. That is also because it's moved on from the ritualistic, uh purpose that it once served. So you had to repurpose it for uh, uh, the stage, right? Like, uh, okay. Yeah. Was repurposed. Also because, uh, you know, we I kind of said that I will take leave, but can I kind of butt into this discussion? Because I think mm -hmm. it's very important. I think, why should the dance culture be monofocused? Why should everything kind of be, what was in the past, be submerged in something now called Bharatanatyam? Let there be modern versions. Let yeah. people experiment and do things, but why not at the same time let this old trail continue with its own excellence? You know, if I think of the old music and the present day music, the present day music is, is very different than the old Rakti music with the, so many gamakas. If mm. I think of the old, it is it's very kind of deeply emotional. Uh, it is not that kind of the, the art of Bala Saraswati was not ritual art. But it was emotional, it was moving, it was full of affect. And that was very artistically created through the music, through the poetry, through the Abhinaya. And let this, that kind of uh, heritage, let it continue. Because there, there was a sophistication, which gradually is so much receding to the background that people talk about it as a thing of the past. But where is it alive? Give it a chance to continue. It should be programmed on to the stages of today as the word classical is really kind of uh, cheating, but mm -hmm. hereditary and um, the other novel or experimental or, or whatever. But I think this old emotional introspective lyrical art, which is not the ritual code because there is the royal code, there is the ritual code. Don't merge them all into one. The ritual, it is gone. Like Ranganaiki said, it is all gone. It will never return. But the emotional, the royal, it continues with its sophistication. Get yourself pulled into that kind of sophistication and perform the truly classical, which is hereditary. And if you get yourself pulled into the modern art, do amazing new things. Create an experience, as I said. Let it both be there. There's space for everybody. If you do. <laughs> well, Akka, actually, that's a great place for you to conclude your comments because this is precisely uh, the vision with and I actually started uh, recognizing dance is, is with this idea that all these visions and uh, constructions of dance and modernity and tradition and everything, they can exist. There is space for everything. They, and, and our vision, uh, I think, uh, not just as Mahalakshmi and me, but also as I think, uh, as representatives of our generation of dancers is to create an egalitarian and dem democratic space 
in the arts where or where there is room for all of these things to coexist and and flourish uh, and um, so on that note i would like to thank you dr saskia saskia ka uh, for uh, this absolutely insightful and knowledgeable and for many of us emotional um journey that you took us through and, and with with uh, the book and i and for all of our all of our viewers i'd really like to thank all of you as well for attending the talk for staying with us for 2 hours uh, despite all of your commitments on a weekday in the middle of the day uh, thank you so much for being here and for uh, encouraging the space um we just like to say that this is this is the first of many more events like this that maha and i are planning uh, and we'd really like your support uh, to help us in this vision of a democratic space and a space for dialogue and discussion and a space where uh, where we want to throw things out there uh, in the open uh, to to uh, be battled over if if they must be but for for this space to uh, to really create uh, i don't know how to put it but like different uh, voices to be heard for different perspectives to come out there for yeah for different voices for different perspectives for different uh, uh, different kinds of knowledge to come come by so that we don't have just one singular idea of our own forms and that we don't have um you know we have multiple perspectives basically okay i'm going on and on so i'm just going to stop by thanking you by by just saying that we we do plan to have similar events like this uh we do want to do uh, more book readings we would like to do more uh, shorter uh, not just books but also articles videos uh and just discussions on contemporary concerns contemporary issues that dancers have uh and it doesn't have to be just bharatnatyam it can be contemporary dance it can be odyssey it can be kathak it can be anything uh we we want to have a space for dance where we discuss things and um uh yeah so uh, the other thing that maha and i wanted to say was that if there's anything that you would like to discuss that you think are pressures uh as members of the dance community or as a concern and rasikas or as scholars or as fellow practitioners uh, please write to us please send us because i mean this is not something that maha and i are claiming to be able to achieve alone there's no way that to ever do this alone so we need all the help that we can get we uh, need all the suggestions that we can get from all of you so please uh, like us follow us support us inspire us and uh, we hope to see you at our next event uh, thank you once again saskia akka thank you very much uh, and thank you uh, yashoda akka and vaishnavi for uh, sharing your experiences and of course everybody that's here uh, thank you thank you very much for supporting us and for supporting this for event. those who've been asking me on my chat where where can they get the book there is uh, it's available on amazon <laughs> Yeah. And you can for this Amazon, but also wait for the 6th edition it will be yeah. out soon 6 6 6 yes 6th yeah. edition yeah. yeah so there have been couple of people asking me that so let's thank you so much all of you yeah i take leave now thank, thank you. you thank you very much thank you i'll end the session